Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 236. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of the Lend at Fintech Conference. Today's episode is sponsored by Lend at Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. It's happening on May 13th and 14th at the Javits Center in New York City. Lending and banking are converging and Lend at Fintech immerses you in the most important trends of the day. Meet the people who matter, learn from the experts and get business done. Lend at Fintech, lending and banking connected. Go to lendit.com slash USA to register. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Monica Brand Engel. She is a co-founder and partner with Quona Capital. Now, Quona is a very interesting firm. They've been around for a few years. Monica has actually deep experience in this space, and that is early stage venture in emerging markets. And uh, Quona have done several investments. Uh, uh, some names you'll probably recognize if, you are, if you're focused on emerging markets. We get into a couple of examples of companies that they have funded. Uh, we talk about the geographies they're working in and why they chose those geographies. We talk about what they're looking for when investing in a fintech company. And we discuss the general state of fintech for good or financial inclusion and why it's really grown in popularity in recent and years. And we cover much more. It was a fascinating interview. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Monica. Pleasure to be here, Peter. Thank you. Okay, my pleasure. So you have a very interesting background. You know, you've worked in you know, the venture and early stage investing for some time. So why don't you give us, give us a little bit of the highlights of what you've done in your career to date? Sure. I'm half Peruvian and had my formative years in Silicon Valley. And I share that because I think they both really inform my journey. Mm -hmm. So as a daughter of immigrants, we sort of had lean startup as a family ethos, <laughs> uh, but also had this, <laughs> but also had this belief of abundance. Uh, if you compare kind of life in an emerging market, especially one like Peru, which has gone through different political regimes, and you contrast that to Silicon Valley, you know, sort of, again, you know, early, uh, even in the 1980s and 90s, where the idea that there's a true meritocracy, that great ideas matched with a uh, sort of a, a view that anything is possible. And I would call it a spirit of generosity. One of the things that really struck me while living out on the West Coast is just the, everyone would open up a conversation and how can I help you? And I think that notion of how can I help you just to, again, start your idea, get the resources you need, find the talent you know, build on the innovation that really informed sort of my career in focusing on financial services and mm -hmm. also really informed the founding of Krona, which is a venture firm focused on fintech for inclusion. So the threads uh, of my career are, are definitely much a, a product of my environment, but also I'll say that just personally, I'm very left brain in terms of where my sort of superpowers are, but Actually, what gets me up in the morning is actually the connection with people, the sort of right brain, the creativity. Mm -hmm. And so marrying, you know, left brain and right brain is also what we're trying to do with Krona, marrying profits and purpose, marrying financial services and technology, uh, marrying developed worlds and emerging markets. It's the power of the and that we think the magic happens. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I noticed that you, know, you, you worked at Axion for a number of years and maybe... You could tell us, I know you still have a close relationship there, so maybe tell us the, the founding story of Quona Capital and uh, how it all came about. Yeah, so I, you know, after business school, I really wanted to, I had been in Silicon Valley for seven years at that point. I graduated Stanford and everybody's in the late 90s and everyone was sort of doing the dot-com thing. And I really wanted to go to an emerging market, again, back to that calling of my background, Ended up in South Africa uh, mainly because of an inspiring uh, story of what was happening with Mandela and post-apartheid, but actually because of the seed I had planted, uh, it was then called Students for Responsible Business, now called Net Impact. A friend of mine in another business school said, you need to call to Acción. And then even though I was living in South Africa, living the dream, uh, it was a phenomenal experience there. I came back to join Acción to run product innovation. And the reason were because they said two things that are also very critical to the founding of Pona. 
the CEO at the time, whose name was Michael Chu, said, one, the only way to solve a problem as immense as world poverty is to mobilize a resource equally as plentiful, and that's the world's capital markets. The second thing he said to me is, Monica, you can't be patient with poverty. And that if you want to find solutions, you have to go to the private sector because they're the only ones who work at the pace that we require if mm-hmm. we don't want to be patient with poverty. And so uh, so I joined Axion as head of product. I really, uh, this is during the time when Clayton Christensen had written Innovator's Dilemma. I hadn't read it, but I was living it, where I was trying to help microfinance institutions innovate, develop new products, which is what they said they wanted. But yet it was really hard to get successful institutions to diversify away from what was making them successful. Mm-hmm. And it was in that frustration that uh, actually I moved to Mexico thinking I just wasn't close enough to the client, working with one of Axion's leading microfinance partners. Their name was Compartamos, now called Tentera, one of the largest microfinance institutions in Latin America. Um, and they had an IPO and that the, the windfall from that, and Axion was always investing along with doing advisory services, again, something very important to Quona, where we invest our operating know-how with capital. That started, that seed, the idea of that powerful combination was planted at Axion, who, with the proceeds of that IPO, helped fund Quona's predecessor. It was called Frontier Investments. And it wasn't that idea of, uh, and, and by the way, Compartamos was criticized when we first had the IPO, saying, how can we say you're helping the poor and make money? So back to that seeming contradiction, which mm-hmm. we thought was a false trade-off. We really believe that there can be money in meeting. And so that really led to them offering me uh, a job to start a portfolio where we would do fintech, not just traditional financial services. So in that, instead of trying to help sort of brick and mortar institutions innovate, we were going to invest in new fintech technologies that would have new business models, new types of products, new approaches to radically improve access and quality of financial services. That is really what led to the creation of Krona, where we found both Acción, who became an investor in our fund, as well as other outside investors like JP Morgan and TIA, Prudential, like very uh, mainstream financial institutions that really wanted, really believed themselves that innovation was going to come from sort of new ways of thinking, new startups. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where my co-founders came in and we created Quanta Capital. Okay. So then, so your um, investment strategy, is it, uh, I mean, I get it. It's right there on your website in uh, FinTech for Inclusion. So that's pretty, pretty clear. But are you focusing on really, like really early stage companies? Are you doing seed? Are you doing series A? Like what, what is the investment strategy? So we have a very focused investment strategy because when we launched Quanta, this is now in 2013, we were an anomaly and we were bucking a trend. At that point, venture capital as an asset class was coming off the worst decade of performance in its history, really as a result of two funds getting too big and earning money off of management fees rather than carried interest. Mm-hmm. We we're also bucking a trend of looking outside, looking to emerging markets. Remember, this is a year or two before Brexit and uh, you know the election of Trump and, uh, and other policies that were really focusing on you know, sort of me first and focusing on, you know, national needs versus global Mm -hmm. and also bucking a trend of this idea of doing impact investing. I think it was still kind of an unproven concept or even microfinance. It had been discredited by some bad actors um, in India. And so even the idea of microfinance being a good thing was all was in question. So we were starting a venture firm in emerging markets focused for fintech for inclusion. So everything that that basically we should have had been three strikes right off the door. (laughs) But I, but I think a few things. One, we had conviction. So remember, my partners and I all had come from emerging markets. We had all worked, lived, run businesses there. And I think that gave us a real appreciation that things happen in cycles. That just the way, you know, the, that you know, there are times when certain countries and markets are out of favor, but they always come back with growth. And this idea of just the enormity of the market opportunity we're facing. I mean, we're talking about basic fundamental needs things like having a transaction account so you can pay your bills or having a loan to finance your business or send your child to college, just very, very fundamental products and services that did not exist or that were too expensive because of the way the financial system was structured in those countries. Mm-hmm. So we just saw, it was like physics, right? You see, you, you know, you see the physics of the business and the opportunity that new technology creates, especially with things like the proliferation of cell phones and smartphones and the expansion of Web 2.0, which allowed you to start a tech company 
for a fraction of the capital it used to cost. So there was a sort of perfect storm of forces and factors that really gave rise to our creation of Quono. And I will say we had some enlightened LPs that were willing to take a risk. And I think that's where the role of Acción, you know, willing, willing to put the first $20 million check in, that really helped sort of, again, put your money where your mouth is, as we all were. So all put in kind of, you know, sort of you know, skin in the game that really helped bring those forward thinking LPs to the table. And I don't think we're disappointed in terms of our results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so then, so so, what stage are you looking at? Are you looking at the startups or? Yeah, so see, see so our start, so our focus is uh, to make them comfortable. We do not do startups, so we look at Series A as our sweet spot. So usually, at least a million in revenue is kind of our uh, rough estimate of what we what we uh, say we need to see product market fit. So we want to see companies that have been de-risked through actual recurring revenue through management teams that have knowledge around those markets and by focusing on countries where the enabling environment, meaning regulation, other venture players, sort of lots of thriving entrepreneurship happening, all that exists in the core markets where we work. So in Latam, it's really Brazil with a, a sort of an increasing focus on Mexico. In South Asia, it's India with increasing focus on Indonesia and other countries in the Southeast Asia region. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's South Africa, uh, with adding Kenya and Nigeria as our wing countries. So focused countries, targeted, you know, de-risk companies at Series A, so not exactly pre-revenue, and with a, f- a focus uniquely on fintech in emerging markets. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. So then maybe you could just talk us through a, a couple of the portfolio companies that you have that you're that you're excited about. Yeah, so I have to say, sort of like asking a mom to pick her favorite kid. I love, I love our portfolio companies. And right. if I had to give, maybe, maybe I'll just give some examples of ones that have, I think, had some really incredible uh, traction recently. So maybe starting in Brazil, uh, we have a company called Credit Us, mm-hmm. which is really the first formal home equity finance and auto equity finance player in the market. So this is a market where there actually is a decent number of sort of what I call them emerging middle class consumers that actually own assets outright. Maybe they own a modest flat or they own a vehicle, but yet there was no product before credit tests that would allow them to use those assets to gain liquidity. So if they wanted to send a child to school or if they wanted to, you know, sort of add a roof, you know, to, or an addition, they would actually have to take out triple digit credit card loans. And until credit test brought up the idea of asset-based uh, financing, so secure loans, which allows them to charge a fraction of what typical consumer credit cost, allowed them to go to market with a very compelling value proposition and resulting in growth that has just been explosive. Mm-hmm. And you know, since then, they've now expanded into other areas like other types of salary loans and other kind of adjacencies. But the core product and really that customer centricity and, and, and solving a market failure has is, is been core to their business. Uh, so that's that's in Brazil as an example. And maybe I'll give you a second one. In in South Africa, we have a company called Yoko, which is a mobile point of sale. So mm-hmm. you think of Square or iZettle or this idea of bringing merchant or digital acceptance down to a smaller business level, not just sort of places where wealthy people shop, and really making the unit economics of that proposition compelling which is exactly what Yoko did, really focusing on the small, what we call the long tail, the small business, the informal or you know, semi-formal sector, where 40% of Yoko's customers have never uh, accepted a digital payment before. And they did it by taking kind of the pioneering work of the IZL sum up squares and adding another layer in terms of creating a value proposition where they bundle in other services that are of interest to a small business operating in Africa. So just been a phenomenal team and a really great journey of a company that has grown uh, tremendously since our initial investment. They have now 60,000 merchants, which is, you know, almost 10x when we started in our mm-hmm. Series A investment. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm aware of both those companies. They really are they're both both quite impressive. Okay, so then maybe let's talk about how big the fund is. How many is this your, are you on your like second or third fund? I'm not, I'm not actually sure where you are in that cycle. And what's sort of the, the typical investment size? Sure. So again, I, we're, we're actually, we're four days away from close. Let's be careful what I say publicly. <laughs> uh, you know, so we, since we are SEC regulated, um, right. we do, we are on our, so just I'll give you facts. We are on our second fund, which will close on Friday. We, you know, sort of the assets under management uh, will be, 
just under uh, about 300, actually just over 350 million assets under management. Uh, and that includes, you know, the both third party funds that we manage as well as the balance sheet, the original balance sheet that Xion uh, seeded. So, and typical investments from each of those funds are very similar. So strategy has not changed really from fund to fund because it's working. So initial investment side is anywhere from two to six or seven million initial check size. Uh, and we reserve at anywhere from one to one and a half X um, for follow on capital. Clearly that, you know, sort of we invest more than one and a half X on our winners. And, you know, there are some companies where we won't double down. So classic venture strategy in terms mm-hmm. of how we deploy our capital. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then what about your LPs? I mean, I know you mentioned Axion helped you get started. And, and, and obviously you don't have to name names, but I'm curious about who else or what, what the kind of LPs you have contributing money here. We have phenomenal LPs. And I, I have to say, I didn't really appreciate it until in retrospect. So, you know, one, we have actually it's mostly institutional investors uh, and actually mostly private investors. So kind of, you know, investment banks, you know, that you would know, global, you know, sort of marquee investment banks that have, you know, through their private banking, through their own client-driven interest have um, sort of stepped up and put us on their platform. Um, sometimes, in some cases, uh, like JP Morgan actually invested directly off their balance sheet. We have insurance companies, so you know, very sort of prominent insurance companies in both U.S. and Europe um, that see financial inclusion and fintech as an important complement and way of bringing their service to emerging markets, which, as you probably know, insurance is very low levels of insurance penetration in most of the markets where we work. Mm-hmm. Uh, another big category of investors are family offices and university endowments, so, you know, kind of Company, you know, so I would say, you know, a balance sheets that are more interested in, in multiples of cash than IRR, I meaning they have big kind of permanent resources of capital and really looking to deploy that, you know, effectively. So, you know, uh, you know, and, and maybe the last category um, would be the development finance institutions, which I think have been always a, a sort of a steady uh, supporter of emerging market in general, emerging market private equity and venture. So, you know, again, really great LPs, mostly large institutional LPs. And in, in this current fund, we're complementing that with, you know, folks from Silicon Valley and Asia, places where we see, you know, venture really thriving and where there's an interest among traditional venture players in sort of it's the, the markets that we are targeting now. Mm-hmm. So what are, what are those markets? Because, I mean, the, the, the developing world is is pretty diverse. There's, I mean, obviously, you've, you've, you've got... Uh, probably I don't know how many I don't know what the total number of countries are, but there's a huge number of countries that that sort of fit into that space. How do you decide which countries specifically to go into? It's a very thoughtful analysis. So we, we've picked regions. I mentioned Latin America, South Asia, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. But within those, we are focusing on countries that have three things in common. Number one, that there's a large addressable market of underserved consumers looking for quality financial services. So you know, just the, the size of the market alone is a very important criteria. Mm-hmm. Two is having the right enabling environment. And when I say enabling environment, that begins with obviously macroeconomic stability, like we're not in any you know sort of war torn countries, but also uh, smart regulation that actually have sort of set the rules of the game so that it's clear sort of what you know sort of where these companies fall if they need to apply for licenses, so that there's sort of an enlightened understanding of you know EKYC and uh, digital banking and all of these innovations that have come up because of fintech startups. Three, the third characteristic is what we call a thriving venture ecosystem. So there are other venture investors. There's a sort of uh, sort of incubators and accelerators with active entrepreneurship happening. So all three really need to be there for us to even begin looking. It's not that we're restricted there, but it's where we focus our attention. And it's why 75% of our portfolio to date is in Brazil, India, and South Africa. So it's not a coincidence that those are our core markets. Right. That said, like you know, emerging, another thing you learn when you work in emerging markets is that they're very dynamic and the change is happening real time. So with this new fund, we just put someone on the ground in Mexico because we think that is a very, very exciting market that is also a very large addressable market where we think it's ripe for fintech innovation. We also added someone in Singapore, given the Southeast Asia interest. So whether it's Indonesia or we just did another rich, really interesting deal in Thailand, we see the growing uh, focus out. You know, India is still a very important part of our portfolio. But in addition to India, there's interesting companies throughout Southeast Asia that mm-hmm. we are beginning to explore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, that, that makes sense. 
So what about, you know, I'm interested in what you find as far as you know, fintech has many verticals, fintech for good can, there's all kinds of different companies that, that could fall into that broad category. So what do you think are the most interesting areas? Where is Quanta Capital focusing their efforts in the different verticals within fintech for good? Yeah, so we because we are looking at the mass market. So what are you know what are those kinds of verticals, those financial service sectors that are really going to be able to address literally the billions or not hundreds of millions of underserved consumers and small businesses? Because we look at both sort of SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, as a very interesting marketplace as well as uh, merchant consumers. And looking, if you focus on those two, there's sort of, I would say, there are a bunch of business models that we have, or uh, because we're very thesis driven, but I would say to give you probably where the bulk of our work goes, starting one is alternative lending. So half of our portfolio is balance sheet. Um, mm-hmm. And when I say alternative lending, you know, think of on deck for emerging markets like Confio in Latin America, mm-hmm. which basically provides what a microfinance institution does, but does everything digitally. So underwrites, you know, basically acquires consumers through performance marketing, digital marketing, underwrites using data that is generated electronically by geolocating the person or looking at their cell phone or payment history. Um, increasingly, uh, with a lot of our small business lenders, looking at what we call um, e-invoicing. So many governments in Latin America, as well as globally, are beginning to require merchants to capture electronic invoices at every payment. And they do that more as a tax collection, you know, avoid sort of business that doesn't get reported under the table. Mm -hmm. But the corollary of having that database is that lenders like Confio, as well as Lululand in South Africa, can tap into a very powerful database of transactional history. So you are underwriting based on actual cash flows, not on the value of a piece of equipment or the willingness of my dad to put down collateral. So it's a very powerful tool. So alternative lending, and, and that's the business side, you know, I, I, on the also consumer side, I mentioned Credit Test, but another great company that I didn't mention earlier is Zest Finance in India, uh, where they're basically uh, lending at the point of sale. So knowing that, you know, plugging into both e-commerce as well as offline retail allows a very powerful way to not only sort of be present for the consumer when they need the the credit most, but actually focus and make sure that your credit, consumer credit is being used for sort of value enhancing, life enhancing goods versus, you know, some other things that, you know, gambling, for example, that credit could be used for. Mm -hmm. So alternative lending is a very big place, maybe a sort of a corollary to that, you know, because in early in our, in our days, you know, sort of looking at specific lending verticals was a big focus. And what we've seen over time is that lending is being tied into other deposit taking and other services to develop challenger banks. So we just, we have a couple of challenger banks in our portfolio. Um, We have Bank Mayan in Brazil. We just made an investment about four or five months ago in a company called Clar in Mexico. And the idea there is basically to not just take lending, but all of the services that one might use a bank for and make that experience digital. So you think of N26 or Monzo, very clear analogs in the developed world. And there's no reason why that the same rationale for those successes in the developed world uh, shouldn't happen in the emerging world. So challenger banking is another sector we're super excited about. Maybe the third I would note is payments. And so again, taking that piece, you know, so if you think about the transactional, you know, I mentioned the long tail. So there's mm-hmm. so much of the digital world that is happening now because you have mobile banking, for example, or proliferation of cards as prepaid and even as MasterCard and Visa, the BMS common sort of really uh, sort of for a concerted effort focused on emerging markets, there's still the challenge of the acceptance environment. So how do you make an economic proposition for a small business to accept digital to pay that interchange? And there are a bunch of companies that are creatively thinking about how to make that value proposition more compelling for the merchant so that you have both sides of the transaction working. You know, the consumer that increasingly uses digital as well as cash and the merchant who sees the value of accepting digital, as well as because it's not immediately obvious, especially if to stock your own shelves, all your suppliers work in cash. Mm-hmm. So it is, you know, it seems obvious, but it, it does take a real understanding of the driving forces to make those businesses operate. And then it's also the last one is insure tech. So insure tech is one where I would say digital lending or banking was uh, maybe five years ago, and we see some really interesting models growing out of insure tech as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so then how how does a company get on your radar? How do you 
reach out to these companies? I mean, obviously there's, uh, you, I'm sure you get a lot of inbounds, but I'm, I'm curious about how do they, what, what's it going to take to, to get like a meeting uh, with one of, you know, with one of your people? Yeah, pipeline is not really a challenge for us. I would just say we are you know, swimming in phenomenal companies. We, you know, we have sort of a weekly dot deal roster and a uh, you know, Salesforce database where we try to prioritize is actually our bigger challenge. And how do you right. sort of decide how you spend your time? And the reason why there's such a rich pipeline is one, it says a really important need. There are phenomenal entrepreneurs that are leaving, you know, coming at graduating business school in the U.S. or Europe. And instead of working at a bank or, you know, uh, locally, they're actually going back home to their emerging country because they see just a much more, much more compelling market opportunity. And so we are there, we are both what we call global local. So we have people on the ground in Mexico, Bangalore, Singapore, Cape Town, Lagos. You know, we have people, you know, Kona staff who live there as well as, you know, travel to adjacent markets. And all we do, in addition to going to our board meetings and serving our existing portfolio, is talk to new entrepreneurs. And then we also spend a lot of time, I mean, again, we really believe in the ecosystem. So we also spend a lot of time in dialogue with our other fintech investors, whether mm-hmm. they're mainstream fintech investors from you know, Silicon Valley, London, or New York that are wanting to explore emerging markets, or you know, maybe I would call them generalist venture investors that have a presence in these emerging markets and want to go deeper in fintech. So it comes from a lot of places, but we are in market constantly. And I would say, you know, kind of, you know, every other week, you know, speaking to entrepreneurs. And so the pipeline is very rich. I think that the challenge is how do you sort of place your bets in companies? Because a great idea is not sufficient. You really need to get that product market fit right. And that is a process, an iterative process of trial and error and a lot of you know, ingenuity uh, to make everything work. Right, right. Okay, so I'm um, just taking a step back. I mean, uh, I'd be interested to get your perspective, someone who's been in this space for a long time. You know, from, from our perspective here at Lendit, we've, you know, we, we noticed the last two years, there's been a really significant uptick in interest on, you know, on, on financial inclusion and financial wellness in general. And whereas, you know, there was, there was very little call for it for us, from our perspective, four or five years ago, from just the, the general sort of fintech community. Now it feels like, you know, our, all the sessions we have are packed and there's lots of interest. We get applications coming in from all over the world with really interesting, you know, interesting ideas. And it's, so I'm, I'm curious for someone that's spent, you know, the last couple of decades, it seems in, in this space, did you notice that? Is there, is there in the general, the general community a much, a much greater interest in, you know, fintech for good? Absolutely. And that, and I, I, to me, that's, that's a huge success. So, I mean, the thesis around Krona is bringing what's marginal to, main, to make it mainstream. Remember I told you when we started Krona, everything we were doing was antithetical to what the common mm-hmm. trends were. Mm-hmm. And I love that actually now we're, you know, not so unique in some ways in that, that the people do really see that there's a very compelling opportunity here. And where I think it's happening is, is from three reasons. You know, first, there is just an enormous market. So if you are fighting for the 1% or even the 10%, I mean, those are very limited spoils. And so I think part of it, quite frankly, uh, you know, you were very generous to call FinTech for good. I think people just see enormous adjustable market. And so I think that number one, it's just, you know, where is the opportunity? Number two, I think there have been some success stories. So there have been some exits. So you look at PagSeguro or Stone Pagamentos, two payments companies, PagSeguro in particular, that's focused on the long tail in Brazil, which is a billion dollar company. So, and that has really, you know, had its IPO in the last, you know, two or three years. So I think you know, seeing these success stories happening in emerging markets also validates the thesis. So it's not just an interesting idea. So I think success. The third, I would say, you know, because again, those successes are still, you know, limited if you compare them to the number of unicorns in the West, for example. But uh, what I think the third point, which actually I think predicts more success, is if you look at the fundamental unit economics. So if you look at WeWorks or some of the scandals that have happened on, you know, companies where you know, you kind of dig beneath the surface and the numbers don't make sense. I mean, how do you build a company on negative unit economics? So if you just kind of dig underneath the, the you know, sort of dig, look under the hood and see the, again, the great margins that focus some of these business models have because of creative uses of technology or the stickiness, the customer retention, so that you're acquiring customers organically, not spending more than it costs, you know, the revenue generate, the contribution margin of bringing them on board. So if you start really digging, 
you see that these are fundamentally sound, not just sound businesses, they are attractive businesses mm -hmm. that would compare against any margin um, in a Western company. So by any, I think all three, I think people are driven by different things, but any three of them are why we see this rush to quality, I'll call mm -hmm. it. Interesting. So then we're almost out of time, but before I let you go, a couple more questions. I'm curious about when you look at the emerging markets today, like what are the biggest challenges that are still, you know, that people are still struggling with and what, what, what needs to really, to really change, to really, to, to, to bring these, these, you know, countries into a lot better, you know, a lot better financial situation? I would say number one is the information asymmetry. So there is this risk premium that is not really based on reality. So, you know, for example, if you look at what it costs for credit in these countries. So I mentioned earlier that half of our portfolio are, we have alternative lenders, we have balance sheet businesses, about half of our portfolio. And so that means that their input there, there is debt. They need to, you know, to provide a loan, you need to have your own debt capital. And it costs them a ridiculous amount of money, equity rates, cost of capital mm -hmm. to provide debt. And it's a fixed income product with, you know, you know, a payment schedule that, you know, we, our companies have a fantastic history of repaying. And so there's a real, and I think if you ask why is that so, a little bit is FX. So there's a lot of volatility in FX markets, which means the cost gets built in is quite high to capture that volatility, but also just the supply demand. There's just not enough lenders willing to uh, operate in our markets. That's changing. Um, and certainly Latin America is probably the most advanced in terms of having you know, very deep pools of capital available. Uh, but I would say that's a very, that, that's, until that gets fixed, you're going to have a very crazy phenomenon, which we have now, where equity is funding loan portfolios. So mm -hmm. you have a total you know, kind of you know, mixed match on, on sources and uses. I think secondly uh, is going to be what I call the talent gap. And uh, what I mean there is, you know, there, there, I mentioned earlier that there's what I call this reverse diaspora, where you know folks maybe you know were born in an emerging market, go to the West to go to school, maybe take the first job, but then come home, and they're really excited about, it. and they come home because again they see this compelling opportunity and this real, ex really exciting dynamism that's available. But you go a layer down, and like, how do you hire your C-suite and your, your managers? And there is a big talent gap. And that has to do with education quality in many of these countries. And again, it's not universal. A lot of our countries have phenomenally strong you know, technical schools. But the, it's the growth that's happening in the sector. Has, the, the talent has not kept up with that growth. So I think there's going to be some important you know, sort of, uh, you know, gaps in companies like Mandela. You know, there's a lot of companies trying to address that gap. But I will say that there's still you know, much more needed to drive that. Mm -hmm. and, and then you know, maybe the third thing I would say is, I guess, you know, it's, it's, it's what we really believe at Corona. Venture um, has become kind of a dirty word. Like to say venture for good. Like I often say what uh, our, our vision is to bring you know, venture capital to emerging markets. And when I say that, I mean what venture was to me when I you know, first got to Silicon Valley, which was you know, the combination of you know, innovation, grit, and smartly structured deals to really do build life-changing businesses. And I think now venture is associated with money and greed and, and you know, just, you know, and, and other more nefarious things. And I really want to bring, you know, the, the good back to venture. I really do think venture, while applied, it's a powerful tool and should not be maligned because of, this, because of some bad actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I, I completely agree. And uh, we'll have to leave it there, Monica. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. See ya. Cheers. You know, I said many times the real promise of fintech is to help those or bring those who are underserved into the, the, the modern financial system. And where the opportunity for that is greatest is in these developing countries. And it's why I think the work that Quona Capital is doing is so important. But people aren't going to invest just out of the goodness of their heart. They want a real uh, monetary return. And that's what companies like Quona are, are demonstrating, that the opportunities here are vast. These are large markets that are not as competitive as some of the Western markets. And uh, that's why I think, and as Monica says, we're seeing more attention given to these markets than ever before and I think that's a, that's a great thing. Anyway, on that note I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Lended Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. It's happening on May 13th and 14th at the Javits Center in New York City. 
Lending and banking are converging, and Lend at Fintech immerses you in the most important trends of the day. Meet the people who matter, learn from the experts, and get business done. Lend at Fintech. Lending and banking connected. Go to lendit.com slash USA to register. <laughs>